it's time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. A few weeks ago, we um, had taken you inside of the studio and showed you the production of the studio. And the glimpse we're talking about this time is n not like that. It's just uh, going to give you a glimpse of what Peter Davenport and the people at the hotline do. So it's not a behind the scene type thing. Uh, once they receive your calls, it is uh, recorded, written down, and then investigated by the numerous investigators that they have available. And I thought this might be a little interesting. Now, some of the things that you're going to see in here is maybe not news to some of you because they are some old cases. I just thought it might be interesting to show you um, how it was put together and give you an overall of um, the way Peter Davenport told it at a conference in Ocean Shore, Washington. So, so they are just bits and pieces of different things. In uh, one is the uh, one of the Illinois sightings that you are familiar with, and uh, the Phoenix lights and things like that. So I thought that might be of interest to you. And like I said, that was a talk that Peter uh, Davenport gave in Ocean Shores. I'm on my way to. Um, go cross country and uh, now I am removing the hotline telephone number off the door of the RV and the reason for that is because people overload the hotline wanting to know if it's for real, if it's a legi legitimate uh, um, hotline and all of that. So for that reason I am removing the hotline number. You can still call me or go to uh, the website um, highstrangeness.tv and we will uh, tell you how to report a UFO sighting or call 911 because Peter has hooked on into all of these. Now I'm not going to talk very much longer but I need to tell you about my hair. Um, as you know I'm now known as the lady with the blue hair. Well it's not really blue today because uh, as I was dyeing my hair my light switch broke in my restroom and uh, I accidentally grabbed the wrong hair dye in the dark and I thought it was blue, but it wasn't. And so it's going to take a, um, a little bit to get it back to totally blue. And so enough of my personal life. We're going to go to the first clip um, with Peter Davenport in Ocean Shores uh, where he's given you some insight in some of the cases that he worked on, some of the big ones. So here we go. Anytime we're ready. We're going to Peter Davenport. Cool. Those of you who do not know me, both of you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Everybody knows you, Peter. See, there really yes, are only Peter. two people here. <laughs> <laughs> I am Peter Davenport. I'm the director of the National UFO Reporting Center, which has been in Seattle since uh, October of 1974. And I am the second and most recent director, uh, still alive, thank heavens. Uh, job I took on in July of 1994 after the center had run for about uh, 20 years at that point under the management, <coughs> excuse me, of Bob Gribble. So I have been a full-time UFO investigator, whether I wanted to or not, for the last nine years. And as you can well imagine, and many of you have heard from me before, it's most, it is without a doubt, without a doubt, the most fascinating eye-opening job I have ever had in my life and those who know me know I've had a few doozies in my past so uh, this has been a uh, it has been an eye-opening experience just parenthetically before I get into my talk I will say most people think that I am a UFO investigator I'm beginning to argue that I'm not really a UFO investigator I'm not studying UFOs so much as I am studying human nature. That is the nature of what I do. Yeah. <clears throat> when you see how people operate, when you see how people report things, in their opinion, objectively report things, in my opinion, somewhat differently, uh, you quickly realize that my job is not a UFO investigator. My job is a uh, welfare volunteer, preacher, uh, somebody who somebody can on whose shoulder somebody else can cry on, and so on. You could be a UFO but educator. A UFO educator. I think that's probably a better term. Thank you for that, Phil. In any event, 
We have about two hours to play with, hour and three quarters or more or less. So uh, that amplifies on what I like to do anyway, and that is to present informally. With a small group like this, if uh, you detect an error, or if I say something that generates more questions than answers in your mind, please feel free to raise your hand or to insert a comment or an addition, an amplification. That's the way I like to do it. And that makes sure that everybody gets satisfied or everybody has had a shot at me and a shot at the subject to make sure that when we all walk out of here, we have more or less maximized the amount of information that it is my intent to impart to you on the subject of UFOs. Before we get too deeply in it, is there anybody who does not know James Clarkson, James and Joanne Clarkson from Grays Harbor, also a very well-known UFO investigator. I'm, I'm delighted to be <laughs> presenting in front of this guy. He's probably seen my presentation three times. But it's still good. But, <laughs> and they're all different, so you'll probably hear new information after I get through Smile. these. These, uh, okay. these slides. Also, Charlotte Lefevre of the uh, chat club in Seattle. Seattle and Phil Lipson. Paranormal group. Seattle Par UFO Paranormal Group, yeah. thank you. Focusing more on the paranormal, I would say, but that's pure bias. They, they tolerate me, nevertheless. Anyway, what I would like to do today, I have a slideshow that I have shown many times. I technically should have a new slideshow every time I make a presentation, but it's just not possible to do it. So since most of you have seen this, not all I know, uh, I would like to go through it. I'll go through it quickly, and then we'll get into some of the new stuff, into some of the stories that I would like to talk about, which will ampl amplify my presentation. We'll talk about some of the recent developments in the National UFO Reporting Center. Some people like to know what's going on behind the scenes. I'm one of them, but I rarely do, even though it's my organization, technically speaking. And uh, just have sort of a general potpourri conversation on the subject of ufology. Now, where would you like me to stand so I don't block the screen? Is this OK? Is, uh, like this? Uh, unfortunately, yeah. if I move that this way, will it yeah. block your view? I can move it. Or yeah, that whole thing. I'll just move it. Is that, you know, that's in your way, isn't it? Uh, this was about August of 1995. We gathered for a barbecue at Bob's house. We took some photographs. Oh, that's uh, fun, Bob and his wife in the background. Uh, Kathy Anderson, who this very moment, or very soon, in Brisbane, Australia, is going to be making this same presentation with some of the very same slides. Uh, she thought she would like to present what you're going to see here today, so she took this presentation in electronic form. She's going to be showing it with her computer. Kathy is now the Western Regional Director for the Mutual UFO Network. Uh, Brenda Roberts, who has a very nice television program in Seattle called Journey, she and I have done about uh, half a dozen or a dozen programs together. Uh, Christian Stepien, who has been our webmaster for eight and a half years, uh, he deserves a gold medal for his dedication, devotion. He's worked for eight and a half years for no pay whatsoever and has done a magnificent job building the website that, according to Google, is the most frequently linked to UFO website in the world today. If you go to Google, type in UFO. That is thanks to Christian Stepien. There are about 1.3 million websites dedicated to ufology at the present time, and uh, we are the most frequently linked to. When we discovered that a year or two ago, we were absolutely flabbergasted. You got to charge for them to link. That's yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> a dime every right, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a rich man. Anyway, enough preliminaries. This is what our data looked like about oh, five or six or seven years ago before we set up a website. How many people have not seen our website? One? Okay. Um, this is what the data looks like, just uh, the date and time of the incident, the location of the incident, the state or country where it occurred, 
and a short description, and if you click on that on our website today, you'll go to a much more extensive description of what happened. So it's just pure, plain vanilla data, which is more a reflection of my nature and personality than anything else. But that's what it used to look like. Well, we need a brighter bulb. Maybe I didn't turn the switch all the way up. Let me get into a few of the cases. Yeah, that's as bright as it'll go. These lights be dim, I'll be. Yeah, if there's any way you could turn off the front ones, that would help, Joe. Thank you. Um, what I have for this early portion of my presentation is a series of some of the most dramatic, most well-documented cases that were reported to the National UFO Reporting Center or have been recorded over the last six or seven years. This was the first really big one. This was the one that I really cut my teeth on that sort of opened my eyes as to what I was dealing with. Before, or when I first took over the hotline in July of 1994, I did it on a Friday night. I heard that Bob Gribble was thinking of shutting down the hotline. He'd done it for 20 years, he'd had enough. I now know what he must have been feeling like. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to shut it down. He'd offered it to MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. They had declined interest. He offered it to MUFON in the state of Washington. They declined interest. So he said, okay. And he had actually pulled the plug out of the wall. I, I've never had good luck, but I made the mistake of calling him on the night of the day that he pulled the plug out of the wall. And I said, Bob, I hear you're shutting down the hotline. I said, I think that's a job I would like to have. And he said, Peter Church. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, boy, that was lucky, huh? Said, Little did I know. So within a month, the hotline was hooked up at my house. And after about three days of telephone calls, I panicked. Because whereas I was expecting to take one, two, maybe three calls per week, I was taking one, two, or three dozen calls per day. It's oh. like pulling your finger out of the dike. <laughs> and I said, what in heaven's name am I going to do with this? Anyway, it was a, a poverty of wealth. This was the first case, really big case, that we handled. This is what we call the Ides of March case. The first report that came to us in Seattle came from Vienna, Virginia which is just west of Washington, D.C. They were on Chainbridge Road. It was father and daughter, both of them senior pilots for United Airlines. They were driving back from Dulles Airport to their home, and the uh, father was driving, the daughter was in the right seat, they were facing west, and all they saw, they both reported to me, was a broad blue-green streak of light that came straight down out of the sky, directly in front of their car, distance unknown, you can't estimate distance, the human visual system is incapable of it beyond a certain point, and they both braced for the explosion. They thought it was an aircraft coming down out of the sky. But there was no explosion, there was no flash. They concluded that whatever came down, streaked out of the sky, must have, before it reached the Earth, instantly leveled out and gone somewhere. That's all they could conclude. So that was the first report. This is what the object looked like. We know that because a woman, I'm going back a slide, from West Virginia was just leaving her the apartment of her elderly mother, and she had just sat down in her, her automobile in the, the uh, parking lot near her mother's apartment, and she was scooting her seat up, and she was thrust forward in the front seat, so her vision up through the windscreen was fairly good. And she called me minutes after this object had gone right over her automobile. She got a very good look at it. She said it was egg-shaped. It was the size, approximately, she thought, of a Volkswagen bus. Do you need our help at all? The light? Do you need my help? Oh. <laughs> Could we, the oh, here are the lights up here, mm -hmm. uh, just the lights up front so we can get better contrast. I don't think. 
Is that better? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, in any event, this object, or several like it, were reported from all of the states that you see outlined in yellow, and all of the cities plus others that you see on this map, in the course of about 20 minutes, it was seen, it or they, were seen over those states and those municipalities. We got calls, in fact, I talked to two police officers from St. Joe, Missouri, who were standing at their patrol car on the highway. Their call center had patched me through. They were on their radios going to the call center. The call center was patched through to the hotline, and I was listening to the two officers stand on the highway describing to me over their radio what they were looking at. It was a blue-green egg-shaped object hovering over the highway. And from that point, St. Joe, it must have streaked to the south-southeast. It was later reported over Florida. Streaked to the south-southeast because the last place it was reported to us was under clouds in Jackson, Tennessee. It was a bizarre night. We, to this day, we have no idea what happened. Uh, a UFO research group out of St. Louis called the Acteon Group, extremely dynamic, extremely capable, found a number of people who saw this thing up close as it hovered close to their cars. And we believe that a young teenage couple, they were out parking on a remote, uh, remote road in Collinsville, Illinois, may have been abducted by one of those things. That's what it looked like. And it was quite a night. This is an interesting case. This is now a different case. You'll see it listed on your sheet if you got one of these sheets of chronological cases. This is from the 25th of August, 1995. <coughs> the, actually, it was the 24th on the West Coast. This was the 25th. On this Friday morning, 40 minutes after midnight, a blue ball that looks like that it was seen later on down here in southern Pennsylvania, was seen to streak over Ontario, Canada. In fact, it created a furor in Canada because as it streaked to the south-southeast over Ontario, Canada, before it got to Lake Erie, it reportedly started spontaneous fires in wheat fields in Ontario, Canada. Multiple reports of that, I cannot confirm them. I do have a tape that I forgot to bring with me of, from Channel 4 in Ontario, whose news team captured this on videotape 40 minutes past midnight this Friday morning. What happened was the object came from down up across Ontario, across Lake Erie. I, ha I believe I have the tape of our first reports of this object streaking overhead, and it got down to Bedford near Breezewood, Pennsylvania, and it stopped and hovered and started strobing about once every second. It strobed six times green, and then it strobed twice a distinctly cobalt blue color, and then it disappeared. This is an artist's rendition of what it looked like, oh. done by uh, Bob Fairfax, who's a UFO investigator up in the Seattle area. Most of you know him. Uh, this is what the object looked like. It had a distinct black band around the equator of it. It had a distinct black circle on the bottom of it. And it strobe eight times, according to a professional race car driver who was driving by this thing at 87 miles an hour. He knew his speed. He's a race car driver. And uh, that's what it looked like. So it streaked over Canada, across Lake Erie, across Pennsylvania in a matter of seconds probably not more than 20 or 30 seconds, and it stopped and hovered in southern Pennsylvania. This is a report we received, a written report we received from a PhD in physics and a professional astronomer. He was in New York City looking west, and he saw this thing streak from his right to left, descending at about a 10 degree angle, and it disappeared from his sight. Um, he said this as it moved across the sky, it sent off rings of light. You can see it apart. A spherical bubble of light was given off by it. 
And the reason I know this guy was a PhD in physics is it took us 14 months to get a written report out of him. I know he's a PhD. Anyway, that was a dramatic case. This is one of the most dramatic cases I've handled, too. This occurred on the 17th of November, 1995. This is what happened in a nutshell. At about 10.20, a disc, the likes of which you will see in a moment, came down the coast of Maine at very high speed. People all up and down the coast of Maine reported to me that the object they saw went from the northeast over their head to the southwest in about two seconds. They just, some of people didn't even see it. All they saw was the green stripe of light that it left across the sky that hovered there for several minutes for some reason. At the same time this object was coming down the coast of Maine, it was reported by three dozen aircraft to Boston Center that was based up here in Nashua, New Hampshire. The home, by the way, of Mike Siegel of Coast to Coast Maine. At the same time this first disc was coming down the coast, there were five red discs hovering around a mountain for about 15 minutes. Scared the daylights out of the young woman who owned that farm up on top of the mountain where those discs or red lights were circling. They were actually going around the mountain. When she first saw them, there were four, she reported to us. She turned off the highway to drive up the rock road to get to her farm, and suddenly the entire county lit up like it was daylight on the 4th of July. She could see mountains miles away from her, and she, all she saw was a red light streak up from her back 40 on the other side of her house and join the four red lights circling around her farm. All of them, she reported. And there we stopped the clip here for a minute. We had gremlins, and so we kind of, um, but it's a safe place to stop it. And uh, I like to draw your attention to the fact that when um, you talked about Collinsville, Illinois, uh, it, that is the St. Louis area. And over the years, we have showed you UFOs from that area. We've also shown you um, uh, other reports from that area. So that's a real hotbed. The other thing is that is where the 110 crop circles were in 1996 um, that I shared with you. Now, to remind you, Peter Davenport made mention of a, a couple thought that had, they had gotten abducted. Now, I know some of you go along with the UFO phenomenon and everything, but there's actually people that is investigating these things, and they have been reported. And I'd like to uh, just read something here for you real quick that came from um, Daryl Sims, the alien hunter, and it says, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. And here in part, what he is, um, oh gee, where have I here, where is it? In part, what he was talking about is, uh, if anything like that ever happens to you, you gather your own evidence. Um, and so, I'm going to go right down the line and kind of tell you what to look for. Uh, so the evidence is there if you know what to look for. Body markings, like bruising and things like that. See pictures of gathering evidence of tattoos, patterns, and other markings found on indi individuals and evidence of abductions. Um, depending how they took place, there should be physical evidence. Scoop marks. Scoop marks um, are... Uh, some people who claim abduction events have their skin, um, they have in their skin a strange scoop mark. This mark looks like a small spoon was used to remove a portion of the surface skin uh, and ex explore that possibility. Fluorescence, that's a very important one. It says a beautiful demonstration of the strange phenomenon of fluorescence found embedded under the skin following some of the abduction events, not only under the skin, but also the area uh, around where uh, these things took place. And then leaves, weeds, seeds, um, things in your bedroom if you happen to be at home, strap marks and needle holes and other evidence. And like Valerie Ufanov, um, uh, the, the um, 
from Russia explained, don't ever deliberately run to anything like that because you don't know what's involved there. So just try not to panic. And so enough about abduction. We might get back get to that a little later. Um, the, next, the next big thing that Peter uh, was really excited about was the Phoenix Lights. And so we're going to tell you, he's going to tell you some things about the Phoenix Lights that he was so excited about. So maybe we can go back to Peter Davenport and his Phoenix Lights. Yeah, in 19, uh, oh, cool, look at that. I'm being abducted again. <laughs> Steve, unfortunately, the woman who submitted UFO. this You've insists that it was not Thursday the 13th of March, but Wednesday the 12th of March. And I said, no, 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 Mrs. whatever her name was, don't you mean Thursday the 13th of March? And she said, Mr. Davenport, I know perfectly well when my husband's birthday is. And I was baking his cake for our birthday party that night. So apparently this incident occurred possibly if we can believe this report, two nights in sequence. All right. Well, that is a rough approximation of the lights that that police officer first saw streaking from north to south. They were distinctly yellow or orange. He said there were five of them in a triangular pattern. Well, this is, we believe, a second different object. Remember I said, we don't know how many objects went over Arizona that night. This, to give you some idea of how big this object is, and you may not be able to see it clearly from where you are, this light went directly over three witnesses, Tim Lee, his wife Barbara, their son Robert. This is in North Phoenix, just outside the city limits of Phoenix. We estimate that that light, which was like a recessed ceiling light, a cam light in the ceiling, was approximately 200 yards in diameter. That's how big that object is. And Tim Lee and his wife, they sent me 20 pages of typed description of what that object looked like. As this light went over their heads and they could look straight up into that light, they saw a vortex like a tornado of gold sparks being sucked up into the craft. That's what they described. But that object came from the north and it went silently right across their heads, at least the starboard wing of that craft went over. Well, different people reported different shapes. This is a drawing submitted to us by an architect, a young woman. I'll never forget her voice. She said, Mr. Davenport, I'm an architect. I do not believe in UFOs. But I've been told to call you because what I saw tonight cannot be ascribed to anything that I'm aware of on this planet. And that is her drawing. She said there, was a, there were lights. She gave five lights. And there was a faint glow on the leading edge of this object. You'll see that again. A few seconds or minutes later, the object looked like that to a witness on the interstate north of Phoenix still, with three separate lights. This is his actual illustration that he sent to us. And he was so, he was so committed to providing us with an accurate rendition of what he had seen that night that he used black paper to simulate the black sky and white ink. And if this is the moon, this is how big the object was relative to the perceived size of a full moon in the night sky. We have reason to believe it was probably bigger. A few seconds later, it looked something like this. This is from Max Saracen and his wife, I believe. A big, long <coughs> triangle with multiple lights along the leading edge. Light was streaming off the two rearmost vertices of the triangle, and that was his, his hand drawing of what he and his wife saw north of Phoenix. Well, this is from uh, a group of investigators in Phoenix. This will give you some idea of the number of ground tracks that these objects reportedly covered in Phoenix. They actually made turns. People could see them moving across the sky, and they'd suddenly turn and go in another direction. Objects that were that big, that's how big they were in the night sky above Phoenix that night. 
Well, this is again another. People reported that when the lights were coming at them, they looked different from the way they looked when they went overhead, and when they were going away, they looked different still. Some people reported that the lights swapped places with one another. That's an unconfirmed report, in my opinion. Well, this is an attempt to provide you with a collage of all of the different shapes that were reported to us. Some people said five lights, other people swore it was seven lights. Other people said it was dozens of lights along the leading edge of the object. Some people said the lights were orange or yellow. Others said distinctly white. Some people said red. So it appears to us that the, uh, the objects had the ability to change their appearance or at least to human observers on the ground, their perceptions were different at different times. That's what happened. Now, this, for any of you who have been to Phoenix, you know that mountain in the distance. That's called Camelback Mountain. This photograph is taken from Sky Harbor Airport, the airport that serves the greater, uh, greater Phoenix area. And the camera is looking north, northeast. That mountain is about five miles from the airport. It's not a high mountain. It's called camelback because it looks like a camel hunkered down on the ground. The head, the hump, and the rump of a camel. Well, one of the objects came right across the notch of that mountain. And I'm going to show you what it looked like after it came across the mountain. That's what it looked like. You'll notice now it's no longer five lights. It's seven lights. And I said, Sue, this is Sue Watson. Sue Watson works. <coughs> excuse me, for one of the most prestigious parochial schools in Phoenix, Catholic school. She has seven children. She and her husband are Catholic. No surprise here. That night, Thursday the 13th of March, she was preparing to take four of her grown children to an Irish music festival as part of St. Patrick's Day weekend. And her two sons and two daughters had gone out the front door. She was turning lights off and locking up, and she heard her children say, Mommy, Mommy, come out here quick. And she went out her house, outside her house, looked to the north towards Camelback Mountain, and saw these lights coming at her. She said, well, it's just an airliner or some kind of strange aircraft. She didn't know what it was. And she stood there for a few seconds as it got closer and closer and closer, and suddenly it got right above them, and it stopped. And I'm going to play a tape for you in a minute of Sue Watson's voice talking about this incident five years later, almost to the date. But that's what it looked like. And Sue said it had seven lights on the leading edge. And there was a distinct, though faint, glow on the trailing edge of the object that stopped above them. To give you some idea of how big this object looked, I said, when I first talked to Sue that Thursday night, I said, hold up your thumbnail for me, Sue, and tell me how big the object was relative to your thumbnail held at arm's length. She said, Peter, 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 you don't understand. OK. So the thumbnail is the, <clears throat> the ruler we use. The yardstick is a fist held at arm's length, a clenched fist. Hold your clenched fist at arm's length, close one eye, and tell me how big the object was relative to how big your clenched fist appears to be. Peter, 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 she said. You don't understand what I'm talking about. OK, tell me how big it was. How many fists was it, Sue? She said, one, two, three, four, five. The object that hovered above her and her four children for five minutes subtended an arc of we estimate 50 degrees. That's approximately 80 to 100 diameters of a full moon. And it hovered above her and her four children. Her sons, watching this thing, lay down on the grass, put their hands behind their heads, and looked at this thing. They could see fine detail on the ventral surface of this craft. Let me play for you a tape. A tape of what Sue Watson, the person who described this to us, you'll see her hand drawing here in a moment, reported to Jeff Rents and me on a radio program Tuesday night, the 12th of March, year 2002, just over a year ago. Jeff and I did a program 
on the eve of the fifth anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Let me play for you what Sue reported to Jeff and me about what this, what happened and what this object looked like. Uh -uh. Actually, my children had gone out of the house before I did. We were going to a, a, a concert that night. And it was a little bit, maybe 20 minutes after 8, I'm not sure, 8.25 or so. And my daughter came running in and said, Mom, you've got to come out of here right now. Um, we've got something coming over Camelback Mountain, which is a, a landmark in Phoenix, and we live just a mile below it. So I ran outside. Uh, at that time, I had four children that were outside with me. And we just watched it. It was the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen come over my house. And it came over extremely slow. I mean, it was just kind of coming over this Camelback Mountain, which is, like I say, a landmark with lots of housing on the mountain. Mm -hmm. I live in a pretty populated area, so I'm standing there thinking, yeah, everybody is watching the same thing that we are. And uh, the kids started laying on their backs on the yard. You know, they, they, laid, they lay down. Oh, they laid, so a couple of the, the two boys laid down on their backs in the, in the front yard because it was, like, magnificent. It was lit with this kind of, um, oh, I don't know how, I, I almost, I told Peter it was almost a yellowish light like they have in parking lots. And it was uh, almost a boomerang shape. And it was, a, it was a solid vehicle. It wasn't something that was separate. It was coming right It was coming right at, you know, very low. It was uh -huh. flying extremely low. There was absolutely no sound on it. And Amazing. there were, um, yeah, I can't remember. I think there were five bright lights in front. And actually, at one point, I saw a laser kind of go down. It was really strange. Because, wow, you know, we all saw different things. But what we were doing was just basically watching at a very, <laughs> very for a pace, this vehicle just flying over. What a sight, what a sight that uh, I just trying to get there and... That's what Sue reported on the Jeff Wrench program. By the way, does anybody mind if I don't wear my jacket? It no. was getting warm. I mention that because if you do, we can have you expelled. We have a lot <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can even take your tie. Yeah. You're losing up. Take the no, tie. No, I want to wear it. It cost me a fortune to rent it for a three-day rent. I want to get my money's worth. <laughs> anyway. You heard Sue say five lights. When I talked to her five years earlier, she was insistent it was seven lights. And she submitted a drawing to us. That is her drawing that we received via fax on Sunday the 16th of March, three days after her sighting. I tend to go along with this number rather than the five. It was right, she did that drawing right after she had seen it and she faxed it to us. She mentioned the laser light. She, so far as I am aware, of the 1,500 witnesses in Phoenix who have submitted written reports to either our center or investigators in Phoenix, she is the only one to report having seen this momentary flash of white laser-like light that shot out of the belly of this craft and struck the ground. What was it? I have no idea. In fact, I have no idea what I'm dealing with. All I can do is but report what was reported to us, Charlotte. Can you report missing time, objection, anything that's not all at the time? Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, there are so many, I could take, I could offer a nine month course on the Phoenix Lights. If you could report now, imagine how bored you'd be after nine months of this nonsense. At about this time, Calls were coming in every 20 or 30 seconds on our hotline. All I could do was take name, number, say, submit a report, I'll get back to you. They were just pouring in, flooding in from Arizona. One I almost feel like I want to apologize for having sat on all this for so long, but I sometimes, you know, I forget that there is some of you that have never heard of these things before because uh, going to a country and the um, circles that I travel in, uh, this, you know, we're really familiar with that, and um, and myself, I have seen maybe not that big uh, and not not that close, but I have seen very tangible UFOs, and reported many of them to the UFO hotline. Now, I've had um, again. This is Dr. Jordan's uh, a photo here behind me. Now, here again, th this is a bit of uh, an email conversation between Daryl Sims and a scientist that would like to remain nameless at this time, 
And the scientist says to the other, well, hey, you know, you, uh, I'm a scientist, I'm clinical, I'm, uh, give me some evidence. And then, and then um, Daryl says, yeah, that's a good question and actually a reasonable one, yet, uh, yet a complex one to answer. One might, for the sake of argument, say, how do you convince me of the Great Wall of China? And the answer is, it's very old, so are UFOs. We have witnesses, so do we. We have pictures, so do we. We've touched the wall, so we know they're real. So have we in our experiences. So we were there, and some of us were there in our events. And so that just kind of stops and make, makes you think. And um, it, it touched, and well, maybe I'll put it in here in case we run out of time. Here in, in the recent weeks, um, a lot of the governments around the world have, uh, they just started to openly talk about it. Valerie Yufanov started the trend, I believe. Um, Jamie Masao, Mexico. It, it's, only, it's only in America. We still have a little problem with that. But as more and more people in governments and agencies in news reports uh, come out about UFOs, the more you will probably uh, find it about as normal as the next person. And, and Fox has covered quite a few. Um, went over Provo Canyon here not too long ago, and I am going there to talk to the people that took that picture, and when I come back, I'll show it to you. I have one more clip to go, and that is um, an insert from Brenda Roberts' show Journey that Peter was making reference to, and it got, it's really, really old, but I thought I would, um, I would kind of give you a glimpse at that. He does a lot of shows with Brenda, and uh, there, uh, the exciting part about that is because he is uh, playing an actual tape from, from airliners, and so I thought we would want to show you that, and um, can't argue with that either. And again, I apologize for having sat on this for so long, so if we could go to Brenda Roberts here. <laughs> Welcome to Journey. If you see a UFO, who are you going to call? My guest, Peter Davenport, is the director of the National UFO Reporting Center Hotline, which operates 24 hours a day out of Seattle, Washington. And he is literally sleepless in Seattle because he answers the hotline, and he's my guest this evening. <laughs> Peter, it's a delight to have another chance to catch up on, on what's been going on with the Reporting Center. It's always nice to be back. <laughs> We want to talk about how long the National UFO Reporting Center has been in existence. Mm -hmm. I think I'm correct in saying that the UFO Reporting Center in Seattle is the longest standing UFO reporting facility in the United States. It was founded in 1974 by my predecessor, Bob Gribble, Robert J. Gribble, quite a well-known ufologist. And it has been running almost continuously for the last 22 years, taking UFO reports from all across the United States. Now, I understand, too, that some of these reports come f from FAA, military establishment, sheriff's department. Yeah. Y you know, your little orange stickers that have your phone number on them are appearing everywhere, aren't they? They are. Uh, I think a lot of people who are new to the field of ufology might, in the back of their mind, perhaps in the front of their mind, think that the majority of UFO reports come from people who are maybe not mentally stable or don't occupy responsible positions in our uh, uh, culture, but that is by no means the case. Mm -hmm. We are constantly getting calls, most of all from the FAA. Hardly a day goes by when we don't get a call from the FAA about a report to them, mm -hmm. members of law enforcement, members of fire or emergency facilities, and so on and so forth. So uh, we get reports over the UFO hotline from all areas of the United States from people in all walks of life. Well, I can vouch for that as a volunteer occasionally. That's right. I answered you... the phone and we, you know, we had a call from the FAA and then it followed up with the actual reporter of sure. a sighting call, you know, we called back. There's a lot of credibility now, I believe, because of how the media may be handling UFOs, yeah. finally. Yes. Uh, in fact, there's been some very good coverage here locally in Seattle, both by one of the newspapers, Seattle PI, did an excellent article on us. I, I have to give them credit because it was one of the first balanced, informative, 
well thought out articles that we've seen in a good long time and we're grateful to them. Mm -hmm. That gave rise to a lot of other media across the United States. The article went out on the wire, unbeknownst to us, so yeah. the phone started ringing at quarter of four uh, the, uh, on one early morning mm -hmm. and uh, it continued ringing for about a day and a half, people wanting more information. Mm -hmm. So we know the interest is out there, we're getting mm -hmm. some very good coverage, we're delighted by that. What do you think the movies are telling us about UFOs now? Well, you know, we, we've had quite a yeah. flux of movies yeah, in this have. subject. Yeah, <clears throat> Independence Day, of course, mm -hmm. uh, The Arrival, another one that came out about the All same right. time ID4 came out. Um, yeah, I think they're, they're inducing people to think about this subject. But one of the things I try to inform people of is that a lot of that, a lot of what people hear about UFOs in the media is fiction or confabulation of one mm -hmm. sort or another. That's not what we do at the UFO Reporting Center in Seattle. We are essentially a clearinghouse for information that is as objective, as accurate, and as thorough as we can possibly make it, given the resources available mm -hmm. to us. So there's a world apart, a world of difference between us and things like uh, Hollywood. Hollywood, <laughs> absolutely, exactly. uh, mm -hmm. yes. But still, it's bringing to the forefront an awareness I think that it's very yes. healthy for us to have that awareness. Yeah. Is it your opinion that we have actually experienced a government cover-up about information about UFOs? That's a very intriguing question and I mm -hmm. think I'm correct in saying that that is a question that intrigues me at least as much as the question of whether we have alien visitors on this on this planet with us. Mm -hmm. uh, my impression is the most polite thing I can say is I, my impression is the federal government of the United States is certainly not bringing to the attention of its citizens what in the final analysis, if it's true, and I believe it is, if it's true will be probably the greatest scientific awakening in the history of man to this point in our development. Uh, I can't give you a categorical yes on that, but it is clear that the federal government of the United States is not not uh, revealing to its citizens what I think some people in that government know. It appears there are factions within the government, those that want to come forward and speak about what they know. Oh, yes. And I've had a few of those on my show. Oh, yes. And those that are still holding that information very close. Yeah. So even uh, that's happening. Later in this mm -hmm. program, I hope if we have a chance to play mm -hmm. a tape, we'll hear an FAA air traffic controller talking to two pilots about that very mm -hmm. subject, about a UFO that w had just been reported by two 747 pilots. Uh, I believe there must be factions of people in, in our government who know the truth about this phenomenon, as I think we are getting closer to the truth by taking call after call after call, every day of the week, literally, from people who are seeing objects in the atmosphere above the United States which by all classical measures should not be there. They're not aircraft, they're not mm -hmm. helicopters, they're not weather balloons, and they exhibit incredible flight characteristics. Nothing we've achieved on this planet yet. Tell yeah, us, let's cut to the us. tape mm -hmm. and let our viewers listen to two 747 pilots talking to the FAA in mm -hmm. Arlington, Mass, reporting what they saw over Long Island, New York on the 17th of November, 1995. Five, the speed bird is in your 12 o'clock. 
talking about 30 miles, 40 miles. So that was not our traffic, the sun's uh, uh, 405 heavy. The sun's a 405 right. And uh, the heading of the traffic, was it uh, the same direction or opposite direction? Exactly opposite, the sun's a 405 heavy. Roger, did it pass off your right side? Uh, left side. Roger. Yeah, and it's the 226 confirms that. Uh, we saw the same thing. It certainly looked like an aircraft initially, but it may not have been. Yeah, and we can confirm this. It was uh, looking very strange. There was a long uh, light in the tail. Yeah, big, big bright light on the front and a, a greenish tail coming out the back. We can confirm this. Let's have the 405. Okay, let's have the 405 speedbird 226. Thanks. Uh, we'll look into it. Military, what help you? Yeah, I'm at that. 32. And Speedbird 226, did it go over? Did it go overhead? The uh, traffic go overhead you, or uh, was it below you? It was overhead and off to the left, uh, much the same as the left here. I actually looked at the opposite traffic, 2,000 feet above. That's what it initially looked like, but then it did have a, a very strong trail to vapor trail, which looked more like smoke, and the light on the front was very, very bright. And as it went past us, it seemed to disappear once it was about five miles behind us. Speedbird 226, Roger. Were you level at 29 at that time? Yeah, affirmative. Roger. And Lufthansa 405, how far off your side did that pass, the traffic pass? It was pretty close, and uh, like the speedbird said, it was looked like two or three thousand feet above on the left wing, just one mile, uh, and on opposite track. And it doesn't have, it didn't have any uh, uh, light, logo light, beacon light, or red or green light, only a uh, Light is on and with a long green light, looked like a UFO. That's a 405, roger that. Like I said, we had nothing flying in the area. You are uh, just north of a military operating area, but uh, the traffic should have uh, varied out that far out, out of the area. Uh, must, must have been a military, the 405. Roger. Jack, you got anything flying out in the area? Negative 105 turned over to 300. Well, then I just had a couple of UFO reports. Oh, that right? I had a couple of guys that uh, reported uh, lights just went going over their head. I had no tra no traffic whatsoever in the area. They, they said it passed within a mile of them, like a two thousand feet above them, opposite direction. They said it was like a light way out on the back. How to look at an object in the sky and determine that it possibly is a UFO? I'm glad you asked that question because we take a lot of calls from people, well-meaning people, mm -hmm. who just are not well-trained in how to observe something mm -hmm. accurately. And most of all, the most important thing is to capture the data, to observe certain things about what they're looking at such that they can report it later and we can get the, the, uh, the data on it. Uh, I would say there are a few simple things that everybody could do. First of all, I am astonished by how few people are able to find north, true north, in the night sky. It's very simple. You look for the North Star. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing, people uh, don't know how to use angles. They'll say, well, mm -hmm. such and such an object moved about a football field length, or it moved a ping pong ball, or it moved an inch. <laughs> yeah. uh, none of this means anything. What you have to do oh, in I that circumstance... Oh, I use for my geometry, maybe? Geometry. Oh, I, I'm glad to hear <laughs> Finally, you I can use it. <laughs> um, Angles are so much mm -hmm. more important. 45 degrees and 90 degrees. Exactly. And Was those it? that move off at a, at a really severe angle, those are beyond our capacity for aircraft, aren't they? Oh, yes. That's, uh -huh. that's one of the things that is really mm -hmm. intriguing is the reports we get from people who watch these things streak across the sky. In fact, mm -hmm. later on, perhaps we'll talk about a system that will allow us to detect UFOs in the Earth's atmosphere because they move at such high rate of mm -hmm. speed. They leave an ionized tail behind them. I think we'll be able to detect that in the future. But uh, yes, being able to report accurately is very important. And mm -hmm. it leads me to one other observation. Human, we human beings are not good reporters of factual information. Um, it's just not our style. We're much more emotional. We, mm -hmm. we like to use symbols and images. But when it comes to reporting a UFO sighting, that information is so very important. Uh, you need things to compare the object you've seen with, so you can tell relative size and so on and so forth. But what I was going to say is the most important thing to do is not call the hotline in Seattle. <laughs> the most important thing for a person to do who thinks he or she may have seen something unusual is write down the facts soon after the event. That is the most important single thing that they can do.
what you see here, now that is a picture that I took in an aircraft flying from the two places we looked at today. Um, I was coming from St. Louis, going to Phoenix. Uh, like I said, the two places we visited today. And um, when we examined it, uh, I, we used to think it was the Enterprise because we looked at it the wrong way. But when you flip it like that, it, that shows it was flipping on the side and it was about to go into a new dimension or a different dimension. And I took that one myself and my heart just really did a funny thing because I thought it was going to hit the airplane. Thank you, Peter, Brenda. Give yourself a hand. Um, keep calling the hotline and come see us next week with a, another story. And um, keep up the good work. Uh, you are for Hotline and, Repo and Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington. Bye. Thank you, Cool. Cool. Yeah. Hmm?